Good morning. All right. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Here we go. Why don't you open your Bibles this morning to uh, John's Gospel. <clears throat> we uh, have been in the book of Judges, and I think we're going to take a, a little step out here and uh, this month, um, Saturday night, as you will see this video, which uh, last night we had our lighting ceremony for Christmas Island. And uh, amazing time. And so we're entering into the kind of a message, our, our, our public outreach, our ministry to our community here for the whole month of December with Christmas Island. And we will host that on the weekends. And it's just going to be a powerful, powerful time. So in thinking about that, I decided, you know, I'm going to take a little time out here from Judges. We're going to look at the gospel message. Today, I want to, I want to, this whole thing we looked at here in Judges, a little off script here, but this whole dynamic of Jesus, the angel of the Lord coming to them and, and asking them after they had prostituted themselves, they had prostituted themselves from God as a covenant people with the false gods of the nations. And Jesus said to them as the angel of the Lord, an appearance, what we call a Christophany in the Old Testament, what is this you have done? What, what have you done? That, that message came out, and if you didn't see last Sunday's uh, tape, you should watch it. Literally what they did, they ended up being married prostitutes. Married prostitutes. Not, not, not temple prostitutes, a different word in the Hebrew language, but someone who's just loose with everything. In other words... I explain it this way. It's like a person that says, yeah, I believe in a higher power. And yeah, I go to church on Christmas and Mother's Day, but I, I don't know. God isn't relevant for me. The word isn't relevant for me today. Even though they would claim to be a Christian or saved, they don't abide by the word of God and they don't, they don't live by it. And, and, and according to the Bible that defines you, them, and I'm not judging anybody, but you judge yourself as a married prostitute, someone who is loose with God, loose with the world, mixing all things together. That, that, that message, that, that word of Jesus coming to them in the promised land, asking them, what is this you have done? It just rings in my spirit. So it's hard to lay that down, but I'm going to pick it back up and I'm going to bring that here into the New Testament. So go to John Chapter 1, I've got it on the screen for you. Look at this. John says he came to his own. Chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Literally talking about the Jewish nation first. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, anyone in the world. As many as received him, to them he gave power. King James says, I believe it's power to become a child of God, even to those who believe in his name. Who were, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14 is this is a key, key scripture today. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, it's funny, even in the uh, Christmas Island display out here, when we flip the lights on, as, as, as majestic as the wise men are and the camel and the donkeys and all the sheep and everything that's going on in the, in the star, there's, there's, there's a majestic glory about that, that stable scene with Mary holding the baby Jesus in her arms. Amazing. Look at this. I preached on this, or I brought this to you some time before, and I'm not a fan of the Message Bible, but the Message Bible says this, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and blood, and... I love this, though. Moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes. The one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son. Generous inside and out from start to finish. Moved into our neighborhood. You could fairly say that Saturday night, through the turning on of Christmas Island, through the lights, that Jesus moved into our Maytown neighborhood for the month of December. Kind of hold that thought for a minute. Now, we saw this in the book of Joshua and then in Judges, and you could fairly say that the purpose of the law, the purpose of God's word, was to create a holy people which were far more uh, holy people unto the Lord, which is far more in the heart of God than just, you know, knowing the heart of God than just doing good things. In other words, the Bible as a whole, both Old and New Testaments, are ultimately about the full 
manifestation of God's presence with his people. And the revelation of, of, of him and who he is um, and his heart to us for us to know that he wants to bless us as long as we obey his word. That's what it's all about. And because of that, I think it's fair to say that the essence of sin can be defined not by category of sin, but by rather by people choosing the absence of God. You could define sin as people, not by different categories, but just choosing the absence of God. In other words, the Old Testament people rejected the law by not binding it to their hearts. We just saw that in Judges. After Joshua and company had died, and Judges 2.10 tells us that after that another generation rose up who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel in Judges 2.10. What is he saying? It's not that they didn't know the stories. It's that they didn't know him personally. They just had a head knowledge and no personal commitment or relationship. And look, it's the same for us today. Because since the birth of Christ and up to our day, people, governments, nations, they've done the same thing. They rejected the message of Christ, the neighbor who was the new neighbor that moved into the neighborhood at Christmas, right? In other words, they know the message. You can see it everywhere. But they also have prostituted themselves with the world because you've got Santa Claus and reindeers and glowing noses and all kinds of stuff going on. They become a married prostitute, mixing Christmas with this whole materialistic false pagan Santa Claus whole thing that's just turned into a lie. Today we find ourselves 25 days, 27 days from Christmas. And again, we have established here at Maytown this, this life-size nativity that is going to demonstrate the gospel message to our neighborhood for the month of December. And then what happens? We roll it up. Does the message stop? No. Did the message begin Saturday night? No. It's always been here. But Christmas is the time to focus now on Jesus coming to our neighborhood for the entire month. In other words, what baby Jesus in the manger is all about is, is the word of God Jesus coming from the eternal, timeless expanse of the heavens with God the Father and Holy Spirit and coming to earth, taking on the form of humanity to become the living testimony of God in the world to redeem us from our sins. Man, I tell you what, that gives us a very clear definition of holiness because at its very foundation, the holiness of God is the sign and seal of God's presence in the world. Still, though, it's easy to misunderstand the full scope of God's coming to us as our new neighbor who has come to live among us and die for us and extend his grace to us for salvation. If in turn all you see is grace and you don't have a proper understanding of his judgment also. We saw this in a series we did on the parables of God a few years ago. And I, I broke down the, 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 the parables as the parables of Jesus as kingdom parables, parables of grace and parables of judgment. And I tell you what, I walked away from that series touched. I was touched by the overwhelming grace of God. Yet what I did see was this. God is not only holy, he not only loves us, and he's done everything for us to be saved and forgiven. And you will never see judgment yet, but there's been grace poured out in every direction first. But because of his righteous holiness, sin will be judged one day. In the end, sin will be judged. Not because he wants to get in with people, nor because he loves judging people. No, God will judge sin because unrighteousness cannot stand when pure righteousness and holiness exists. And that day will come. It comes when you take your last breath, or it comes when Jesus returns to this earth, as the gospel says, because that's who he is, our righteous, holy God. Now, that's why to understand the holiness of God is also to have a proper understanding of the judgment of God also. In other words, this dispensation of grace that we're living in has... It's been used against us because it has been so polluted and it has been mixed with a, with a postmodern gospel that tries to define us, that says, you know, all things go. And the Old Testament isn't relevant. It's, you know, written a long time ago and we've evolved past that. We haven't evolved past the revealed nature of God ever. It stands in the Word of God. Now, you have to understand, when God judges the world and he will do it, and he will do it for everyone and to everyone, 
He does so by holding up his standard, his standard of righteousness. So here's what that means. Because God is perfectly righteous, he's just not great on a curve, right? In other words, God does not measure us to determine if we are mostly righteous or mostly wicked and make up the difference with a dose of grace. No, this again is a misunderstanding of the attributes of God that, that pits them against one another or holds them in some kind of unwarranted tension. I would say it's a falsehood to say that the attributes of God balance each other out because that's to impose human understanding of God. You can't do that. So let me think about this for a minute. When the scripture declares that God is righteous, it means that he is perfectly righteous or infinitely righteous. This means that even the smallest sin cannot go unchallenged in the presence of God. In fact, the New Testament teaches us that whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all, James 2.10. What is the point? The point is that when we disobey God's commandments, it's not merely a rejection of a particular point or a legal code. No, it's because choosing to break any part of the law, Paul says, is simply to stand against God himself. In the Old Testament, it was written law. In the New Testament, it was understanding sin as opposing God and rebelling against who he is, not, really, not merely breaking his rules and regulations. I believe this is fundamental to our understanding of holiness because holiness is not merely about keeping laws or rules better than the next person. Now, holiness is about our whole relationship with God and how we embody his message personally in the private and before the world. Thus, the judgment of God is called forth whenever God holds up his infinite standard of righteousness and holiness against the world. That's why the book of Romans teaches us that the wages of sin is death. To put it another way, God looks at the world and sees all of the destructive powers of evil unlashed in the world, and he is determined to set it right and restore his creation to its original design and glory and holiness, but only for those who call upon his name. That's the Roman road. Watch this. Look at this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't care what you believe. Out of mind, out of sight, out of mind. Doesn't pull you out of what the word of God says. Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world. Talking about Adam. And death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Christmas, folks. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Easter. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That comes by grace through faith. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Romans 10, 13. Whoever call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise of his sacrificial blood. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing from the word of Christ. In other words, that salvation from eternal death and separation from God as God gives you faith. But as many as received him, he gave power to become. Faith comes, but it's believing the message in the heart, not just head knowledge. Wow. I tell you, it still rocks my heart. You know, it's like gospel message 101, right? But it's not. It's what Christmas is all about. It's what salvation is all about. Grace and salvation are introduced and received many times in the scriptures. The scriptures are also filled with examples of God's judgment being extended to the world. We saw this as we walked through this, this whole year. We saw the sons of Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu consumed by the fire from God's presence because they brought unauthorized fire into the Holy of Holies and they were consumed by God. We saw a man name isn't even mentioned. He was stoned to death for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. Numbers 15. We saw Korah and those who joined his rebellion against Moses. We saw them swallowed up by the earth. Number 16. Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead for lying to the Holy Spirit, trying to get favor, trying to build favor in the, in the, in the foundation of the New Testament church through hypocrisy. 
Herod was struck down for not giving God the glory due his name in Acts 12. A man was sexually involved with his father's wife and was turned over to Satan by Paul for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be convicted and saved, 1 Corinthians 5. We know Revelation 20 tells us on the final day of judgment, anyone whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20.11. We also know, the Apostle Paul tells us, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ one day to be recompensed for the deeds done while in these bodies, whether good or bad. Let me pull that into last Sunday's message. One day we will be recompensed either as true believers or those who prostituted themselves with the world. And the list goes on. The bottom line, folks, is this. Whether any one person agrees or, 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 or disbelieves in the holiness of God or even the existence of God or Christmas, the pure message of Christmas, God's authority and right to judge is rooted in the doctrine of creation. Understand this. When the Christ child came into the world, he not only moved into our neighborhood, he moved here for the purpose of grace. That's his heart. But he also moved here for the purpose of judgment. You're given a chance to understand and to know. Now it's up to you. We know that the scriptures say in Psalms 24, 1, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And since he created us and we belong to him and are accountable to him, disbelief, just because some any one person chooses to disbelieve or prostitute themselves with the world, doesn't make you autonomous without accountability. I mean, that's just it. That's one reason why evolution versus creationism is so critical to the atheist, because if you can pull a creator God out of creation or out of the mix, then hypothetically you can pull any responsibility, judgment out of doing your own thing, your belief, your sin, your sexual orientation, e all the above. Do you see it? The postmodern gods of this world, the return of the gods, literally that many are prostituting themselves with. Wow, here's what I know. Sometimes God responded to sin immediately, while other times he extends a grace. And just as immediate judgment quickens our hearts and leads us to repentance, we also understand that delayed judgment gives the necessary time for reflection, repentance, and the reception of the means of grace. And only God knows, right? Thus, both times of judgment and instant, instant and delayed serve the purposes of God. And it's all about Christmas. That's where it all starts. That's not where Jesus started. We talked about that. I mean, some people think G Christmas is when the first time Jesus is invented or comes in humanity or, I mean, or, or comes into form or in engages with us. No, we've seen that some 12 times in the Old Testament. The Word a Christophany, manifestation of God, Jesus the Word appears as he did to the nations in the Promised Land back in Judges. So let me close with these final thoughts. All right? I know this is a lot. Have grace. It's been a crazy week. I've, and I've had a neck issue going on. And, you know, it's funny. We laugh about computer demons. Some people say, ah, oh, Pastor, you get so cranked up and so wired about the gospel message. So here am I all alone in the building, and I'm going to record this message for you, right? I walk from my office to this end of the building and the breaker goes off. The breaker pops. Okay, the breaker pops. Well, the breaker pops as the printer was printing my sermon out. So the printer jams. So I have to go back to the breaker panel, figure out why the breaker popped. It just popped. Flip the breaker back on. There's no means or whatever. It just does, right? It shuts down one side here, lighting main, which blips the cameras and everything else. So I have to get it fired back up. Then the printer's jammed. I can't get all the paper. can't figure out why the printer wants to be jammed up. I can't get my sermon. When I finally get it unjammed, then it has this code out of toner. Seriously? You know, honestly, I, I'm very humble with myself. Who am I? Am I this big of a threat? to the kingdom of darkness that all of this junk always... And it's like this, like any one given day when I go to tape, something somewhere won't work. Why is that? Yeah, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a fight. It's a war. Let me close with these final thoughts. Let me go back here to where we were. 
The Word became flesh, John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That's the message. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory like Father, like Son, generous inside and out from start to finish. The Passion Translation, I have this up there for you also. And so the living expression became a man. The living expression became a man who lived among us. We gazed upon his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, overflowing with tender mercy and truth. <laughs> this word here, the Greek word for word, right? It comes from the Greek word logos. And it has a very rich and varied background in both Greek philosophy and Judaism. The Greeks equated Logos with the highest principle of cosmic order. God's Logos in the Old Testament, God's Word in the Old Testament, is this powerful self-expression in creation, revelation, and redemption. Here in John, though, we find this unique view of God which signifies the presence of God Himself in the flesh. Now, many have translated this rich term Logos as Word. However, the, the root of, this, of, of its understanding could also be translated message or blueprint. I like that. So in other words, Jesus is the eternal word, the Logos, the word of God, the creative word, the one who became the visible message blueprint of God in the man Jesus Christ. Thus he is the divine self-expression of all that God is, contains, and reveals incarnate in flesh and human flesh. In other words, just as we express ourselves with words, God has perfectly expressed himself in Christ. I like that. <laughs> so what is Christmas? What is Christmas? You put the Passion Translation and the Message Translation together. You put Jewish and Greek culture and understanding all together and you come up with this. Jesus Christ, the Word, the Logos, the full expression of God became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. Folks, I this message could be, what, 30 minutes or it could be one minute. Get this in your spirit. Christmas is all about God moving into our neighborhood, coming and engaging humanity. You could say moving into our neighborhood literally meant moving into our houses, our house, our temples. He moved into humanity. He went local. He came out of this timeless expanse, and he came down. He came at Christmas. He left at Easter. But when he left at Easter, he sent the Holy Spirit with the keys to that neighborhood house, the kingdom of God. It's amazing to me. When I look out here at Christmas Island lit up and I think of the baby Jesus, I think of God engaging humanity, not by an angel of parents, but he engaged humanity. He comes into our world, into our neighborhood, into our neighborhood, right? For the expressive purpose of revealing himself to us. And now that he's gone, we have this extended period we call grace until he returns again, the grace of God. He will allow us to draw near to him. The Holy Spirit will draw us close to him. We'll see his power, his signs and wonders. He wants to revive us. All of these things are, are given to us. They are, they are expressions of him, all of the gospel. It's all there. Or he will also allow you to prostitute yourself with the world. It's your choice. That's what grace is all about. If I was a father, I wouldn't have invented grace because grace for some is a license to just end up in a Christless eternity. Why? Because all things work and there's no judgment. Folks, my prayer for you is this, that this Christmas you will understand the true message of what Jesus did when he came to earth. Emmanuel, God with us. Understand, God the Father, righteous and holy, who must judge sin, was the one offended at the fall of Adam. Therefore, he's the only one that can forgive sins. He's the only one that can forgive the offense because the offense was against him and him alone. So what does God do? God comes to earth. You know, I preached the message a few years ago, 23 and me, the 23 chromosomes of Mary and the 23 chromosomes of God. And he binds them together. He takes on the full form of humanity, fully God and fully man. We don't know how that works, but that's the message. He lives sinless among us. He demonstrates for us what humanity could do through the power of God 
in a sinless state, and then he takes that perfect sacrifice, that, that perfect body to the cross as a sinless sacrifice for all the sins of the world. Now it's up to us. We can see it. We can understand that at Christmas he moved into our neighborhood to express that to us, to give us salvation, to lead us unto this glorious one day to be with him, absent from this body, and one day a new heaven and earth here. Wow. That's all about Christmas. I would encourage you. It's kind of a hard word. I don't judge anybody. But listen, my job is not to make you just feel fuzzy. My job is to put it out there and, and challenge you. Let the Holy Spirit touch your heart. Think about it. Let me pray this morning. I want to pray about Christmas, about this one who came into our neighborhood. Father, I just pray for anybody out there that using right out of Judges 2.17, playing the harlot, who are playing the harlot. They're mixing the gods of this world with the true Christian faith. And they're not judged. And everything is happy. And they have jobs. And everything is good. But they're headed for a Christless eternity. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can't believe in a higher power. Judges tells us that a whole generation after Joshua rose up who did not know the Lord. They knew the stories. They didn't bind those stories to the heart. There's a whole religious movement out there that knows the gospel but doesn't, they don't own it. They, they haven't bound it to their heart. The book of Acts with power, signs, wonders, and miracles, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all it is is a historical record. It's not bound to their heart by faith. I pray for that man, woman, or child right now listening that you will gaze upon the Christ of Christmas and you realize it was God, Emmanuel, the Word, the Logos, coming to earth into our neighborhood for a purpose of saving you and saving me. And that's the message. Father, I pray right now we just confess our sins. We say, Father, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I just confess my sins. I accept the gospel message. I understand you came to save me. I understand you left this earth through the cross to send the Holy Spirit to sustain me, to hold me, to guide me, direct me, and illuminate my mind to the Word. And I accept that all right now in Jesus' name, in this pre-season, pre-Christmas message, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, a little bit of rambling today. Sorry about that. I really have had, man, this neck thing. I've been shut down. And God is good, but... And today is pre, uh, you know, it's Wednesday for me here, pre-recording. Thanksgiving tomorrow, Christmas Island, work party Friday, and then the lighting ceremony. i got a lot to do, so I pray that you're blessed by this. Go to the Word, listen to it, let it consume you, and just know this. you got a new neighbor if you just uh, pray that prayer. Get to know him, all right? Yeah, in Jesus' name, amen. If you want to uh, give... We, we welcome that. You can go to MaytownAG.com and on there you can give your tithes and offerings. If you want to be a friend of the Christmas Island, man, help support it. Give, give a kindly gift there, mark it, and we'll see that it gets there and, uh, and our building fund. So God is good. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving. All right, I hope you had one, I guess past tense. Hope you had a good one and uh, let's go, man. Let's get ready for Christmas. Amen? Amen.